a small, contested piece of land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Today, many of us have heard of the Palestinian-Israeli or Arab-Israeli conflict and its prominent role in Middle Eastern relations, regionally and globally. Today, we will take a closer look at the guiding hand in the start of the modern iteration of this conflict, Britain. What were Britain's underlying motivations in the Palestinian mandate? How did Britain's actions in Palestine serve or sabotage these goals? Britain's primary objectives throughout the world wars and interwar period were the maintenance of its diplomatic alliances and territorial integrity. But in its efforts to pursue both goals through disingenuous neutrality, Britain alienated both the Arabs and the Zionists, contributing to the fall of its once great empire. The international politics of World War I highlight many of Britain's diplomatic motives in Palestine. In 1914, Germany was the center of the political Zionist movement, with Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire home to the most politically active and vocal Jews. However, Germany could not speak out in favor of the Jews or a Jewish homeland for fear of offending their ally, the Ottoman Empire who were crucial in dividing Allied troops, ships, and resources across multiple fronts. Still, Jews around the world, and particularly in America, favored the Germans and Central Powers. This was in large part because of the persecution Russian Jews had faced in Tsarist Russia. In 1914, prominent German Jewish philosopher Hermann Cohen even traveled to the United States to persuade American Jews to side with Germany and get the U.S. government to join the Central Powers. After the United States officially joined the war on the side of the Allies in 1917, made easier for the American Jews to swallow after the overthrow of the regime in Russia in March, Russia began to consider pulling out of the war following said overthrow. The British needed to maintain its relationships with its allies and keep them invested in the war. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George's influence further points to the Brits' top priorities. A Welsh evangelical Christian George came to favor Zionism due to his belief that doing so would fulfill some biblical prophecy, an example of biblical romanticism as an underlying source of sympathy for the Zionist cause among predominantly Christian nations. George also held an over-exaggerated idea of Jewish financial and political influence and believed their allegiance could help turn the tide against Germany, also a common underlying motive for politicians supporting Zionists. However, John Bond, a scholar with the Balfour Project, asserts that biblical romanticism and sympathy for the struggles of Jewish diaspora are merely covers for more nefarious desires. The motives were not religious, but hard-headed imperialism. Their religion was the British Empire before it was ever Zionism. London realized the strategic significance of Palestine's location near the Suez Canal, a crucial piece of infrastructure in maintaining India, the British Empire's crown jewel and noted the value of, in the words of future governor of Jerusalem, Ronald Storrs, a loyal Jewish altar in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism, a particularly appealing possibility given growing sentiments of Arab nationalism and anti-colonialism in Britain's Arab territories. Amidst this growing prominence of Zionism, Foreign Secretary Lord Balfour informed Lord Rothschild and the Zionist Federation of the cabinet's decision to support the cause in what became known as the Balfour Declaration, which is controversial for both its conflicting promises with other British territorial promises, chiefly the McMahon-Hussein correspondence, and its vague language. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the right and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Key points of contention are the interpretation of national home, i.e. recognized independent state or protected access, and civil and religious rights i.e. whether political rights of native Palestinians are protected. The non-committal lack of clarity in the Balfour Declaration would become characteristic of British attempts to placate Palestinians, Zionists, and international allies throughout the Palestinian Mandate. This problem came to a head before the Mandate even officially began. When the British captured Jerusalem in December 1917 and established a temporary regime, 
they failed to establish a clear stance or allegiance, heightening tensions between suspicious settled Jews and resistant Arabs. Many of the British military officers and administrators had been stationed in the Arab world, particularly Egypt and Sudan, before coming to Palestine. As such, they had an established familiarity with the Arabs. Some even suspected that the Jewish immigrants from Russia favored the Bolsheviks, feeding a relationship of distrust between British and the Jews. The British also never addressed the growing frustrations among the Palestinian Arabs, allowing them to fester until April 1920, when some of the Arabs revolted by attacking Jewish settlers. Later that month, at the San Remo Conference, the Allies officially assigned the Palestinian mandate to the British, and the colonial office took over for the military. At this point, the British should have determined and articulated a more official policy, but Britain's determination to strengthen its diplomatic relationships in Europe and the West by upholding its promises to the Zionists, while maintaining its hold on its Arab colonies by not entirely alienating their subjects and leaders, made this task undesirable. The ambiguity of British policies continued when the League of Nations assigned Palestine as a British mandate and tasked the empire with following through on the Balfour Declaration. While this seemed promising for the Zionist cause, Colonial Secretary Winston Churchill's 1922 white paper, stressing that Britain had no intention of making Palestine as Jewish as England was English, and restricting Jewish immigration to Palestine's absorbative capacity, and the British grant of Transjordan to Abdullah, seemed to signal the contrary. Nonetheless, the appointment of Sir Herbert Samuel, who promised to be fair to both sides, as Britain's first civilian governor to Palestine, signaled a possibility for peace, or at least temporary stability. During Samuel's term, the Israelis united, establishing organizations and infrastructure, which would later make them a more attractive candidate for independent statehood. Meanwhile, the Arabs fractured. The British stance of neutrality lost all viability after the Wailing Wall incident in 1929. The wall had been carefully regulated to ensure peace and cooperation, but when Jewish worshippers brought benches and a screen to the venue, the Arabs viewed it as a violation of the existing customs. Fights quickly broke out and escalated into a small civil war, during which the Arabs massacred the Jewish community in Hebron. The British sent Lord Passfield to investigate the situation, and he issued another white paper, concluding that the Jewish agency and Zionist land purchases were to blame for instigating the massacres. After outrage from Wiseman, the British rescinded the report, showing the Arabs the influence of the Zionists on the British, whose policies began favoring Zionists as the Jewish political atmosphere rapidly expanded. Growing Arab resentment would ultimately cause the 1936 Arab Revolt. The increase in Jewish immigration to Palestine in the late 1930s due to the Great Depression and Nazi pressure drove British colonial secretary Cunliffe Lister to pursue the transformation of Palestine into a self-sufficient colony, no longer reliant on British taxes. In order to do this, he ignored previous immigration and property sale restrictions. Consequently, the Arabs went on strike in 1936, leading the Peel Commission to propose a partition of the Palestinian territory into two. The White Paper of 1939 replaced this proposal due to Arab opposition, demonstrating the significant Arab influence during this time period. The British explained this shift, with the rising German menace, Arab goodwill, and the Palestinian stability would be crucial. Yet another example of Britain's territorial and military ambitions taking precedence over the will of the Palestinians or Zionists. After the image of Britain rejecting Jewish refugees through international criticism, it deemed the mandate unpopular and ineffective, and thus counterproductive to its true goals. Britain renounced the mandate on May 15, 1948, and handed its responsibilities over to the United Nations. The member states failed to come to a conclusive resolution regarding Palestine. The Arabs and Zionists no longer nursed intensifying grudges, but openly fought each other, deeply impacting the lives of Jews and Arabs around the world for decades to come. As far as the impact on the British Empire, British oil and trade route interests led them to favor the Arabs in the ensuing war, 
but reliance on American aid prevented the British from committing. Israel policy, as well as frustration and embarrassment over Arab defeat in Israel, contributed to Arab nationalists and independent movements in the following years, which did hurt the British Empire. But American aid in World War II and through the present day may offset that loss.